listening to the TCB Radio Network. Hello, friends. This is Elvis Presley. I am Marion Fox, the official sex symbol on TCB Radio Network. This is Mindy Miller. This is Ray Walker from the Jordanaires. This is Elvis of Speedway co-star Victoria Page Myrie. This is Cynthia Pepper from Kissing Cousins. This is Zoe Botto, author of Elvis Styles from Suit Suits to Jump Suits. This is Don Wilson, and if you're looking for Elvis, you're in the right place. TCB Radio Network. Where it's all about Elvis. Everything is about Elvis. It is all about Elvis. All Elvis, all the time. If you want to listen to something really stylish, listen to tcbradionetwork.com. You can't do any better than that, so stay with us. People who know Elvis know about TCB Radio Network, where it's all Elvis, all the time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. Conventional wisdom is that Las Vegas is what destroyed Elvis Presley, launching him on a downward spiral of drugs and boredom, erratic behavior, and eventually his fatal overdose. But fans of Elvis know better, and so does our guest today. For the 50th anniversary of Elvis Presley's first groundbreaking Las Vegas show, the story of how Vegas saved Elvis and Elvis saved Vegas in the greatest musical comeback of all time. It's a classic comeback tale set against the backdrop of Las Vegas' golden age. Richard Zoglin's here to talk about his book, Elvis in Vegas, and it is a feel-good story for the ages. Richard, welcome to the show today. Thanks for coming on with us. Uh, Great to be here. We're so excited to have you, and I understand you are a senior editor at Time Magazine. How's everything going I'm over a, there? Well, no, I still write occasionally. After many years of being the TV, the theater critic, I've been working uh, writing for Time for more than thirty years. So uh, things have changed a lot around there, but uh, still a great magazine. Awesome. Now, tell us what inspired you to write this book. Have you been an Elvis fan your whole life? You know, not more than most people. I would say just an average Elvis fan. But I was originally I wanted to write a book a lot about Las Vegas' golden age of entertainment, kind of the 1960s heyday years from the Rat uh, from the Rat Pack show in 1960 to Elvis's big comeback show. But as I started researching it, I discovered how much connection Elvis had with Las Vegas uh, that I didn't you know even realize that he first played Vegas in 1956 when he was just coming up and uh, the Vegas, uh, he was a young rock and roller, the Vegas nightclub crowd didn't know what to make of him. And and it wasn't a particularly successful engagement, but he uh, he loved Vegas. And he uh, I didn't realize how he, would, he was a, a constant visitor to Vegas. It was sort of his favorite getaway. He would come there often, see shows. And he, of course, made Viva Las Vegas there in 63. And he married Priscilla there in 63. Seven. And so when it came time for Elvis to return to live performing after, of course, nearly a decade of not doing any live performing, uh, Vegas was somehow the logical place. And so that connection with Vegas is what really uh, inspired me to, to, to make Elvis the centerpiece of the book. As a, you ask, am I an Elvis fan? I'm much more one now after I was <laughs> listening to everything. Uh, so now it, it was a, a really great experience to sort of follow his career through the prism of Vegas. So uh, I really, you know, ended up uh, appreciating him a, him a lot more after um, after doing this book. So this this one concentrates on, on Elvis, but apparently you've got a lot of research material. So are you still planning on writing your other book about the Golden Age, or did you kind of meld that one into this one? I, I think I I think I combined them. No, I did what I wanted to do on Las Vegas because in between, if, if the, the book tells two stories. It tells the story of Elvis and Elvis's in a career trajectory, kind of on the downhill side in the in the mid sixties when things weren't going so well for him, and then the huge comeback uh, in Vegas in 69. But at the same time, I want to set up that comeback in Vegas by telling what, what Vegas was like when Elvis was was coming back and how El- Vegas had gone through its own kind of difficult times too. It was, you know, at the, at the center of the entertainment world in the early 60s, the Rat Pack were the, were 
the kings of Las Vegas, but then it too started to have problems in the later 60s when the, when the Beatles came along and the rock and roll revolution and the counterculture and all that, and suddenly Vegas wasn't so cool anymore. Young, the younger generation was not going uh, to Vegas, and the rock groups were not coming to Las Vegas. But then, you know, Vegas goes out and finds the original rock and roller at Elvis brings him back to Las Vegas. He kind of introduces rock and roll to the, on the big Vegas stage, draws a whole new audience to Vegas, and I think set up Vegas for its transformation in later years to to kind of what we see today. The kind of because Elvis brought a different kind of audience to Vegas. The earlier sort of nightclub crowd was uh, that that went to the Rat Pack shows. Uh, was different from the audience. Uh, Elvis drew uh, an audience much more broad-based, middle America people, Elvis fans who maybe had never been to Vegas before. So he brought more families too, and and you know they would come from all over the country to see those to see Elvis. And I think that was the beginning of, El- of Vegas's transformation a little bit away from the sort of gambling and nightclub town of the '60s to this big family theme park extravaganza kind of city right. that we know today. So um, that so I tell both of those stories in the book, and I feel like I did that job. Yeah. The other thing that I've, I've always found so fascinating is that, as you said, he pretty much bombed when he first went there in the 50s, and then his greatest success towards, uh, you know, later in life was, was right there in Las Vegas. It's just it, It's just always kind of... An interesting fact, I thought, yeah. why he would even want to go back there after he didn't do so well the first time. Right, right. I think that uh, th- that was the one thing that in 1956 was, of course, Elvis's big breakout year, and everything went right for him. You know, every TV show was a spectacular success. Every every song he released was a you know a big hit. Uh, the one mistake in that kind of in that year uh, was playing Vegas because he wasn't he wasn't a Vegas performer uh, the Vegas crowd he, rock and roll was too new for the for the older middle-aged Vegas crowd and so it, he, he kind of flopped I mean some people tend to overstate it it wasn't as if he was a bomb or anything but he was you know it was it was just not a great engagement for him uh, so the idea but the idea that he would come back in 69 and do that. He really had something to prove to Las Vegas, but also to himself, you know, as a performer. Yeah, and maybe I misstated that, but not the type of reaction he was used to getting. Uh, Absolutely not. No, that, that was, that was a, a, a kind of a blow to him in 56. <laughs> but he got over it fast, fast, I think. About how long did it take you to write the book? How long? It took me a, a little over two years. Not a, not a hugely long time. I, I, I wrote a book previously on Bob Hope. took me took me longer, but Bob Hope had had a hundred years. <laughs> he lived <to> do <laughs> But El, uh, you know, I I was on a schedule because I wanted the book to come out in time for this 50th anniversary of the uh, of the Vegas comeback show, and so that that kept me <laughs> kept me going, kept me on schedule. And I know you've got a big event coming up in Vegas to celebrate the book. And will you talk about that? What kind of uh, festivities are there going to be? Well, there's festivities for me. It's just, uh, uh, I'm going to talk at the, you know, and uh, do an event just talking about the book at, at the library there. I'm talking on TV and radio. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what Vegas has planned. Uh, I know there's going to be, um, you know, articles and radio TV about it. Uh, and I just wanted to be part of that. So I'm going out to Vegas right around the time of the anniversary. I also hope to, uh, be at Elvis Week in uh, mid-August in uh, Memphis. Okay, can we talk about that for a minute? Because Peter and I are hoping to be there for a couple of days, too. Maybe we can run into you. Do you know what they've got planned yeah. for you while you're out there? Well, I I, I know that they have um, a big reunion concert. They're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Vegas show as well. And I know they have some of the band members who are still around coming back. James Burton and Ronnie Tutt. They're going to do a concert and a panel. And uh, I want to be there just to see it. I mean, my God. Oh, yeah. And most of those are people that I talked to for the book. Um, James Burton, Ronnie Tutt, uh, Terry Blackwood, one of the backup singers. And uh, uh, so it'll be quite an event. 
Oh, that sounds really exciting. It's going to be a blast. So that's one of those official Graceland sanctioned events. I'm sure you'll be on the grounds and, and doing all that. Yeah. Well, I hope they bring you yep. on stage, too, and, and uh, give you some time to talk about the book and, and give you some promotion. It's fantastic. We're working on that. <laughs> oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> we'll definitely keep in touch because we, we, hopefully we could attend something like that. We're, gonna be a, we're doing a really short trip this time. But yeah. um, goodness, we'd love we'd love to run into you and see you. Yeah, yeah. With the with Elvis, it's, it's interesting. The uh, almost every year there there's an anniversary of of something. I know uh, next year is the 60th anniversary of his uh, Welcome Home special that Frank Sinatra did. Oh um, uh, yeah. In That's Miami. what I know. You're right. They do uh, celebrate every anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that this one, though, is particular. You know, of all the anniversaries, wow, the Vegas comeback show. Because, you know, we all know how important that was to his career. Absolutely. Uh, and totally um, revitalized him as it revitalized uh, Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Now, I know a, a lot of Elvis's musicians have worked with, with several other uh, people, I know that James Burton was re- with Ricky Nelson for a while, and uh, sure. it, did, did that did that kind of light a fire for you to say, hey, you know what, maybe I need to write a book about this guy or that woman or something like that? Uh, well, you know, I, <laughs> I I just generally try to skip around subject matters, and, and so I, I love, you know what, made, what was interesting when you talk about James Burton and uh, some of the other Glenn Hardin and the people who were session musicians who, uh, that's an interesting kind of area. I don't know. I'm not really a music person, um, you know, music industry person, but the whole idea of these guys whose, whose names you don't know, who were known as great session musicians, uh, who worked with lots of different people. I mean, interestingly, James Burton had worked when he came on board with Elvis in 69. He'd worked with everyone from Frank Sinatra to Merle Haggard and uh, and Ricky Nelson, and uh, he could do rock, he could do mainstream, you know, jazz. He 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 was an amazing, you know, versatile uh, and skilled guitarist, and and he was known, and that was the guy that Elvis picked uh, out of all the people that were available. Mm-hmm. And Elvis was very good at picking, you know, picking his uh, musicians, and they were a key part of the success of that show. So that is an area that really interests me. I don't know if for me there's a book in it, but uh, <laughs> it certainly sparked my interest. And, and uh, I, in fact, you know that that would be a good book for somebody. Uh, the, the whole session musicians, the people, the, the the faces, the names that you don't know who were key to so many artists' success. Yeah, as you said, he was almost masterful in picking the right musicians for. The material he was doing. It's a doing. good book for you, Pierre Alden. You should write that book. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to the TCB Radio Network Podcast, where we're celebrating the life and memory of Elvis Presley with a mission to share his legacy with the world. Hi, everybody. I'm Krista Joy, founder of TCB Radio Network, and I want to let you know that tonight's show is co-hosted and sponsored by PeterAldenEntertainment.com and PeterAldenLive.com. Peter Alden is a classically trained vocalist with a voice like velvet who performs everything from country to pop while specializing in the golden era of rock and roll. Based in Orlando, Florida, but able to travel all over the world, he can come to you. Please support TCB Radio Network by hiring Peter Alden for musical entertainment or to MC at your next event. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Peter Alden Fan. Well, my question is now, in your opinion, what do you think placed Elvis above, like, the drawing power of people like with the Rat Pack, Tom Jones, Wayne Newton, all those guys are huge, were, are (laughs) huge figures in Vegas. What do you think gave Elvis, maybe it was those fantastic musicians that you're talking about. What do you think it was? Well, I think his stage charisma was just unmatched. Uh, You know, the say the Rat Pack shows were for a different era. It was much sort of cooler, uh, more intimate sort of nightclub type of shows. And they were, of course, very big. Sinatra was always very big in Las Vegas. But Elvis brought that 
first of all, that rock kind of energy to the stage of Vegas. And it was different from almost anything uh, that Vegas had seen before. It was really a rock concert for a Las Vegas showroom stage. And um, the only precursor that, uh, you know, to Elvis, the, the one show that may have influenced him a little bit was Tom Jones, who was very big in Vegas starting around 68. And Elvis went to see Tom's show, and Tom had that very uh, sexual, uh, exciting, high-energy stage presence, uh, also kind of flirting with the women in the, in the audience a little bit, uh, tight pants and all that. Well, Elvis took took some of his moves from Tom. He got friendly with Tom. Uh, they would talk about their shows. And I think so he, he got a little bit um, from Tom. But Elvis went beyond Tom Jones. I think just as a singer, he was just uh, more, he, he could do more things. Mm-hmm. He was, he, he had a great voice. Tom had a great voice too, but um, it kind of didn't last too long. He sort of <laughs> strained his voice a lot. He was tough to listen to. He, he, you could hear, you could feel him working and sweating. Whereas <laughs> Elvis was, of course, uh, amazingly uh, energetic on stage and really, you know, worked himself into a frenzy, uh, sweating, out of breath. But boy, he still could, he could control it in a certain way. Anyway, I think on just as a stage performer, I just think nobody could match Elvis mm-hmm. in, in Las Vegas, even though others were big draws. And then uh, just the, you know, both he, he offered both the nostalgia for, you know, the, or the, you know, throwback to the 50s. And so the older fans who remembered him from the 50s loved it, but he also could do the new stuff. Uh, he was introducing new stuff all the time. He was in, doing covers of songs that other artists had made, you know, famous, and he did them sometimes better than the originals. And so he, he could do gospel, he could do country, he could do, uh, you know, mainstream pop standards. So he just offered something for everybody. And I think that, and that's what made him stand out in Vegas. Now, what do you think, for example... A lot of people, a lot of people criticize uh, Elvis because he didn't actually write any music. Do you think any of that came into into play? Because I know he w- he could take he could take someone else's song and pretty much make it his own. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good point, and I think that's why Elvis was having trouble in the after the Beatles came up. A whole new thing happened. Suddenly, singers had to be songwriters as well. They, you know, most of the groups of the of the late '60s, from Bob Dylan to Simon and Garfunkel, were were uh, uh, writing their own stuff. And so Elvis looked like a, you know, too old fashioned. He was just a classic singer who sang other people's material. But think about it. I mean, right? He was not a songwriter. But Sinatra wasn't a songwriter either. He was, uh, and, and we think of him as a great artist as well. You can be an interpreter of mm-hmm. other people's works and, and, and be a great artist. And that's what Elvis was. He could take, he, he knew how to sing songs. He didn't, he never pretended to write songs. And that is a great skill and a t- great talent in itself. It's just that that talent was uh, valued less in the, in the mid to late sixties among in the rock world because singers were supposed to write their own songs, express their own feelings and their own views. You know, it was great, but that is one talent, but that doesn't, that's not the only talent in, in the musical world. Right. Well, and as you said, I think Elvis was very good at picking material that, that did kind of express how he was feeling uh, about right. things. Yeah, I mean, sure. He showed that you could take somebody else's song and put your own stamp on it and get, you know, great emotion out of it, make it a statement, a personal statement as well. Uh, not every singer. Not every great singer can be a, a songwriter. All the great, you know, the greatest singers from opera, from opera singers to uh, mainstream pop jazz singers are, are singing other people's songs, and we we revere them. And so Elvis is in is in that category. He's not in the um, singer songwriter Beatles Rolling Stones category, but he's great nevertheless. So. When you set out to research uh, this book and talk to a lot of the people that knew Elvis and worked with him, I'm sure that there's some stuff that, that you already knew because there's been so much written about him. But in your research, 
did you did you learn anything or discover anything about Elvis that kind of surprised you? Well, sure, all the way along. One little piece of his history that I think I bring out and I learned from from people and from some reading was his relationship with Liberace. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I'm talking about Las Vegas, and he, he came to Vegas in 56, and he didn't do very well, but that was a big uh, engagement for him for two reasons. Uh, one, he discovered the song Hound Dog there. Uh, a, a Vegas lounge group uh, called Freddie Bell and the Bell Boys were doing Hound Dog. Over their, their kind of rock, uh, rock and roll version of Big Mama Thornton's song. Elvis saw it, loved it, and... Um, put it into his own act and then recorded it later that summer. And the other thing that happened in 56 was he, he met Liberace and Liberace was a big Vegas star at the time. And with that over the top flamboyant performance style, he meets Elvis and he said, he gave him one piece of advice. He says, your act needs more glitz. <laughs> wow. and I, I, you know, I, I love that because, and Elvis really, uh, liked Liberace as a performer. I think he appreciated his showmanship, and I think he learned from Liberace. How many people would would link up those two performers? And they were friends, if friendly at least, throughout their lives. I think that that link was something that was new to me and surprising. And uh, the other just general thing that I learned from talking to all the people that are still around who either worked with Elvis or were part of his circle, or or just even met him just once or twice, or you know, fellow show business people. I, I just was impressed with how how much people liked Elvis. It, it, I never heard a, a bad word about him, and I honestly that is unusual for a biographer. Um, that people, you know, there might be people who didn't like him, but no one, you know, who, who really knew Elvis. They, they just thought he was a, a really nice person, polite, gracious, southern manners, uh, modest about his fame, curious about other people, a reader, a listener. He, you know, he was a good person. He was not, uh, it, you know, things happened later in his career when he, in the later years, when he got a little crazy on stage sometimes, and, or the drug problems, or he had a temper or something, but it, Basically, everybody liked Elvis. He was a, he was a nice person, and I just was impressed by that. Yeah, that's kind of been a common thread uh, with a lot of people on our show, and of course, we're a show for Elvis fans. So, but it's nice yeah. to hear that as a biographer, even you got that perspective. You know, because people yes. aren't trying to impress you about Elvis or anything like that. We're on our on our show. Of course, they know they're talking to Elvis fans, so they're they always right. keep it really positive. That's really interesting. I'm glad you shared that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and, and I I did a biography of Bob Hope. And I can tell you that there were people, you know, most people like Bob Hope, but there were people who didn't. <laughs> for various reasons. Uh, I didn't find one who just didn't like Elvis. Um, I mean, they might have criticized some of the things that he did later in his career and were bothered by the drug use or something. But, uh, but they, you know, they all genuinely liked Elvis and were rooting for him the comeback show, everybody, when he made that comeback show, it was such a great triumph for him. And everybody was happy for him. Mm. And everybody in, in, in his circle, everybody in the rock world. I, I have a little anecdote in the book. A journalist named Ray Connolly, who interviewed Elvis in 69, was a, a rock journal, a British rock journalist. And he talks about after the show, after the finish of the Vegas engagement, he was in New York trying to interview Bob Dylan. He was in his in Bob Dylan's manager's office, and Bob Dylan got on the phone. And when uh, Connolly told him he'd been in Vegas to see uh, Elvis, Bob Dylan instantly was interested. You know, what was the show like? Who was in the band? What did he sing? And was just you know thrilled to hear about this. And then Connolly, a couple of weeks later, was in back in England talking to John Lennon. The same kind of questions. Everybody was interested to hear about the show and happy that for, for Elvis's comeback. It was it was really nice. Everybody in the rock world was rooting for him. 
That's amazing. Do, do you think that has something to do with why we're still talking about him? I mean, he's been, he only lived 42 years. This year will mark the 42nd anniversary of his death. And, and yeah. the legend lives on. What, what's your opinion on why are we still talking about Elvis? Why are we still so in love with him? Gosh, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, I think his music just, just holds up. And you can, I listen to over and over again to the music and I, keep, you know, I just, whetted my appetite to keep listening. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, the music just holds up over the years. And the, and the personal story is just fascinating. You know, this kid from Tupelo who had fame thrust on him when he really couldn't uh, know how to handle it. What impressed me, you know, I was talking about a later era, but in 56, just reminding myself about how this kid was experiencing the sort of fame that no one had ever had before. I mean, the, the kind of screaming adulation fans uh, on those tours ar around the South was just unprecedented. And how a kid could, with no experience in that world, could survive and, and, and uh, was, was amazing. So, and then to go through the career ups and downs and maybe the down swings in the 60s and then to come back to reinvent himself as a performer. I think it's just a great show business story. It's just a great personal story and a great show business story. And I think so. I think the personal story continues to resonate uh, and along with the music. So I guess that's my best analysis. That's a, great, that's a great answer. What do you hope that Elvis fans in particular, what do you hope they'll get from reading this book that they probably haven't gotten from all the other stuff that's out there? Well, I, I would, the reason I wrote the book is that people have, as you know, have talked about that comeback show in Vegas for, for a long time. Um, and, and other books have been written about it and, and lots of people have talked about it. But no, in all that, no one, really talked about not only what Vegas did for Elvis's career, but for what Elvis did for Vegas. And that's what I think I bring new uh, in this book, um, how Elvis was really instrumental in turning Vegas in a new direction. As I said, it was before Elvis, it was kind of the, it was still a nightclub town. Nightclub shows were more intimate, smaller venues, just a different kind of vibe going on. Elvis brought that big rock concert-like extravaganza to the Vegas stage and bringing that new audience, which a much broader-based audience, which I think set up Vegas. I, I say it was sort of a, the starting gun for all the changes that would happen in Vegas over the, you know, a couple of decades, the next couple of decades. The, basically, the rebirth of Vegas as a kind of big family vacation mecca the theme park hotels, the big, you know, the, the Mirage and the, and Caesar's Palace and so forth. And the big, big shows, the Cirque du Soleil, uh, to the, to the residencies today of, of starting with Celine Dion to uh, Jennifer Lopez and Lady Gaga. They are all, uh, Elvis was the first kind of, of that kind of show. I think it sort of pointed Vegas in a new direction. So I, I, hope what I'm bringing to the table is uh, a, a new perspective on how Elvis impacted Vegas as well as how Vegas impacted Elvis. Yeah, this book sounds fantastic. So, Richard, everybody listening want to know where they can pick up Elvis in Vegas. So can you let us know yeah. where some of the places they can get it? Well, you can get it in any bookstore. Uh, it's a Simon & Schuster book, and I'm sure that every bookstore near you will carry. Or you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on barnesandnoble.com. You can get it on any uh, of the independent booksellers. And it should be all over the place. And I'm hoping to get a lot of attention for it, sort of tied in with the anniversary of the show. Mm -hmm. And when you're a book author, you just try to get as much attention as possible. <laughs> so I'm very happy that you folks are talking to me. Oh, we're so honored to have you. And please keep in touch. Let us know about, you know, how things develop during Elvis week. We will be sure to let all of our listeners and friends know because... I'm sure they'll want to come meet you and shake your hand and all that stuff. So absolutely, okay. we, yeah, we're having a we're having a a, a meetup 
ourselves, and so we will definitely remind people to uh, go see you when you speak as well. Yeah, if you happen to be on okay. Beale Street on August 13th at 7 o'clock, we're going to be at a little place called Tin Roof doing a show. So if you happen to be around there, drop in and say hi. <laughs> All right. I will see what my schedule is. I'd love to see you. All right. Richard, well, thank, thank you so much, much for uh, spending so much time with us. We really appreciate it. Great. I had fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to our show today. Don't forget to subscribe to TCB Radio Network on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. By subscribing, you'll get a notification as soon as our latest episode drops. While you're at it, please rate us with a five-star review. This will help other Elvis fans find our show. Also, this just in, you can now subscribe to our podcast episodes on YouTube. We also have a YouTube channel that includes archived episodes of our Facebook Live broadcasts and more. You can find links to this and so much more at tcbradionetwork.com. TCB Radio Network is strictly a fan publication, not affiliated in any way with Elvis Presley Enterprises or any of its affiliates or subsidiaries. Please visit us online at tcbradionetwork.com. All trademarks, product names, company names, and logos mentioned are the properties of their respective owners. All opinions stated within do not necessarily reflect the opinions of anyone else and certainly not Elvis Presley Enterprises. Still the King, our theme song for TCB Radio Network podcast, was written by Shane Douglas, produced by Terry Fullwider at Blue Spot Studios, and performed by Peter Alden and his band, Crown Electric Company, featuring David Fontana, son of Elvis Presley's original drummer, DJ Fontana, on drums. Elvis Presley is still the king. Well, he's still the king. That's all. And he sure could sing. That's all. Still the king. Oh, my God.